Yo, what's going on? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor here with another sermon review. If you're wondering what we do on this channel as well as all of our social media, we are here and we exist to help believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life today. As I've already said, we're going to be doing that through a sermon review. This week, we're going to be covering a sermon from Ascend Church, Pastor Ken Heisner. You can check out this full sermon without my commentary. Link will be in the description below. So why are we covering Ken today? Well, full disclosure, um, this uh, Ken was not on the list of people to cover, but somebody had posted on their stories on Instagram that this was an amazing sermon. And... I wanted to sort of balance this out because we, one of the things that we have when we do these sermon reviews, since we're going off of a list now that you guys submit, it's just sort of a, it's a, it's a roll of the dice. It's a crapshoot. It's a gamble. It's any terminology that you can use uh, that demonstrates that I have no idea what we're going to be covering. So I wanted to kind of insert here a sermon from somebody that I, I felt had pretty good discernment in regards to good sermons and we are going to be looking at a sermon today from the sin church again preached by kid heisner to look and see you know okay what what are the things here that make this sermon good now as with all of the sermon reviews we're going to be looking for three things that are distinctive uh, to sort of gauge uh, good sermons and all of that. The first thing is going to be, does he read the scripture? The second thing is going to be, does he exegete the scripture from culture and context? And third, does he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? These are the three things we are going to be looking at. Now, you might say, if you're new here, that's a pretty low bar. Well, oh, just go watch some of the previous ones. Sometimes we don't even hit those three markers. In fact, I reviewed my own sermon a while back. If you're interested to see if I hit those three markers, you can go check that out as well. So let's go ahead and jump into it today from a sin church, uh, from Ken Heisner looking at, does he read the scripture? Does he exegete the scripture? Does he preach the gospel of Christ? Let's hop right into it. Well, good morning, all of you. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to thank you, Justin. I uh, just wanted to Give a big thanks out to all of you who made such a great event possible for us yesterday evening at the Holy Smokes Barbecue put on the, by our men's ministry. Uh, I'm surprised to see some of you here this morning, honestly, for all the food we consumed together. It was a fantastic event. We are spoiled here in our church body to have so many people who serve so relentlessly, unseen and unseen, to make these kind of opportunities for us possible, uh, opportunities to give us fellowship, connections and, uh, and opportunities for personal witness. So thank you to all of you who served. And since it's Father's Day, I thought I would start off this morning with a dad joke. Is that okay? <laughs> you know, I had a joke uh, about chemistry ready, but I wasn't sure it would get a reaction. So uh, <laughs> you saw I kind of slipped that in under the radar. You know, that's a pro move for all of you young dads. <laughs> I kind of did get the reaction I was expecting. Uh, but one thing that has exceeded our expectations over these last few weeks has been the great preaching we have received here, hasn't it? Man, I mean, as we continue throughout this summer of Jeff's sabbatical, um, I am just so blessed by the continued exposure to this wonderful network of Great Commission Collective churches and leaders. So one thing, as he starts off here, um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, we're actually starting at Minimark. Uh, about probably 26 minutes or so, right around that minute mark. You'll have to kind of gauge if you're going to watch this by yourself, but that's where we're at. We're at 27 minutes, 24 seconds right now, but obviously he's had a little bit of an intro. Uh, one of the things here that I think is interesting as he starts out, just, just you know, if I had walked into this church and sat down and started listening to Ken preach here, is that um, their pastor is on sabbatical. Now, you don't, first of all, you don't hear about that a lot. There are not a lot of churches that either do or can send their pastor on sabbatical for the entire summer, give him the paid summer off for study. Like they just, not a lot of churches can do that. Not a lot of churches. Uh, I think maybe one I've attended has actually ever done that. Um, and some of the time it's because of, they don't have the resource that Ken just mentioned here. Like there aren't pastors in the church that are able to step up to the plate and be trusted as elders to preach the word of God. Apparently, a sin church does have that, uh, that capability, or at least a network of, of pastors that can come in and fill the pulpit and be trusted with the word of God. Um, there's a podcast I have coming out uh, in the next couple weeks 
uh, on the Babylonian Pastor Podcast with me and my friend Rob that we talk about that. The importance of having pastors in your congregation raising up elders so that you don't have to bring in people from other churches to fill the pulpit because you have you have godly men that are qualified in your congregation. And that's just it was really cool to hear that, um, that they have that sort of thing um, as well. Also, I didn't mention at the beginning, I have listened to this sermon all the way through once. So there, I've, I've heard it once. So there are going to be things that I allude to that are probably uh, coming up in the sermon. Just so you know, I, I have listened to this sermon once before, um, before recording it. So anyway, that's interesting, right? I could have done without the joke. We've talked about, l- let me sort of unpack that real quick. So we've talked about intros before and the importance of intros. And as much as I like, think it's kind of silly to, um, like make your hook, like your beginning hook to really grab people and draw them in. There is something to be said about losing people pretty early on in the sermon, right? Um, if you have a bad opening, if you have a corny joke that potentially might people might be like, oh, what was that? Right. Um, it, I, I personally, again, I am not the greatest public speaker. You can go listen to the, the audio sermons I have on this channel. I do not proclaim to be the trophy pastor that can preach the best. But one of the things that I have noticed in myself and in others, right, you want to make sure that you have a really smooth takeoff um, in regards to just really introing people into the word and into what you're going to be doing. Not that the joke runs it. I'm just saying like, I was like, we could have done without that. But anyway, let's keep going. Leaders that love both Jeff and Sally, as well as our church family. I know you've been blessed as well. It's Time for the home team this morning, so (laughs) would you pray for me? It's hard to follow those acts, but it's truly a privilege to be here with you this morning as we open up God's Word together. You know, I I love a good origin story, don't you? I remember growing up in the 70s and 80s, uh, and I was completely mesmerized by Superman the movie. You remember the 1978 movie starring Christopher Reeves? Anybody out there that old? Okay, all right. I still think that's the best Superman movie out there, not only for the way that Christopher Reeves played his role, but also for the way that that movie connected its audience to Superman's origin story. And this morning, as we open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 13, if you take your Bibles out, we are going to get a glimpse into our origin story. And my prayer is this morning that you and I, as we look into this passage together, that we will be stirred and inspired to be a part of someone else's origin story. Okay, so one of the things that, if you've ever been in like a hermeneutics class um, for pastoring, right, what you're going to find is there's always this, well, typically, there's this idea taught that you need to like make some sort of, so transition or cultural revelant statement to grab people and then bring them in. We've talked about the opening, like the opening of sermons, almost on every sermon review we do, like how do people do it, right? Sometimes they introduce themselves, tell a story that directly integrates with the scripture they're using. Sometimes they use scripture right away and just jump right in. Um, Sometimes it's a totally unrelated joke or something that, that, that then they use to just, it's just this really clunky intro. Um, he, Ken here, happens to use uh, Superman's uh, origin story to talk about our origin story and about how we can be part of somebody else's origin story. Um, again, this isn't, this is going to seem, seem nitpicky, but just as people that maybe if you're a pastor or you're looking to become a pastor, this is what I would recommend, right? We could almost cut out everything Ken has said up to this point and say, hey, do you ever think about, like, where did Christianity originate? Like, how did you end up in this church right now? And how does that directly connect with the beginning of what we see with the apostles in Scripture? And then go into Acts chapter 13. Um, the, just the, the, to me, again, this is, I understand this is nitpicky, but to me, the Superman reference is like, eh, like, was it needed? That's the question I always try to ask myself. That's the question I I would encourage everybody that uh, speaks in front of others to ask themselves. Like, is this necessary or am I using this because I was taught that this is something I should use, right? Uh, Does it make it clunkier? Does it make it a little bit more difficult? Again, if we cut out everything we started with up until now, we only lose two minutes, but I think it's sort of a smoother intro and it really hooks people into what Ken is actually trying to get them to think about, which is where does my origin story as a Christian begin? Like how, like in the new Testament, 
where does that connect? And we could have done without the dad joke and the Superman reference and just started with that question. Have you ever thought about how what happens in the New Testament connects with you here in your seat this Sunday morning? And then that's an intriguing enough statement, I think, to get people thinking, oh, yeah. And then you jump into Acts 13. Again, it's nitpicky. I don't think it changes like the, the impact of the sermon. I'm just saying as far as intro goes, when, when we as pastors are thinking about how we're introing into the sermon, how we're grabbing people, hooking them at the beginning uh, as speakers, I think that's a smoother intro than the dad joke and then the Superman reference and then getting to your real point. Again, just a, a friendly critique as pastors as we do that. Um, again, we have a limited amount of time and we really do want to hook them, um, to get their attention at the beginning and not lose them while being honest with what we're trying to hook them with, which is the origin story of the faith. I want to begin by asking you a question this morning. How did God bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into your life? I want you to reflect on that for a second. See, that's the real question, right? So that would have, I'm sorry, that would have been great. How did God bring the good news of Jesus into your life. Acts 13 is, is a pivotal moment in the spread of the gospel as we witness its movement throughout the Gentile world. By the way, that's our world. And in Acts 13, we are shown through Luke's quill a piece of our origin story, how it is that God moved throughout history and through people to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to you and me here today. I'm going to answer our question for us this morning. How did God bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to you? Well, he did it through preaching. And I'm not necessarily talking about what we're doing here this morning, a man behind a pulpit. What I'm talking about really are people just like you who clearly understood that the primary calling of God upon their life while he left them here on earth was to cross over the threshold of silence and to speak the words of good news into the life of another person. These are people who, in the power and initiative of the Holy Spirit, moved toward people with the good news of Jesus Christ. If you do a quick survey through Acts chapters 13 and 14, one thing that should stand out to you as a theme or pattern is preaching or proclaiming the Word of God. There are no less than 22 references that I counted in these chapters that indicate that preaching Christ was the primary calling of God's church. And I think the church has long understood this. But I'm also convinced that the church has long had an enemy, an enemy that is working very hard to move her away from the primacy of preaching. And I think that's what we're seeing happen today here in America, a drifting away from the church's primary calling. And what we're talking about here is the not so subtle shift that has taken place away from the proclamational nature of our ministry and calling, and specifically that is preaching the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to people in places where he's not being proclaimed toward what is termed incarnational ministry, which holds as its central tenet living the good news rather than preaching the good news. We don't, we won't get into the reasons why this shift has taken place in our message today, but if you want to dig into some more resources, I can highly recommend to you a podcast by Dr. Owen Strand. It's called The Antithesis. I highly recommend that you check it out, especially his episodes on the negative world and the winsomeness project. All right, so Ken starts off with really alluding to what his, what he's sort of going to sit on today as he looks at Acts 13, which is the proclamation of the gospel with the distinction being the actual speaking of the gospel versus just the incarnational ministry, which he's going to unpack here in a minute, which is just the, the, the saying, I live this out, but I don't necessarily speak about it. Um, now, one of the things that we mention, uh, we, I mention all the time on this, uh, on these, on these reviews is that oftentimes I'll critique and say, Hey, Pastors, if you're going to say this is an important thing, but not explain it, then you should at least provide resources or a PDF for other people to, you know, to look into it. And Ken does do that. He, he uh, mentions the uh, Owen Strange podcast, The Antithesis, and recommends two episodes for people that if you want to look into this more, then this is where I would go for that because this is what I'm meaning when I talk about that. 
He's the only pastor that I've seen do this in all of these sermon reviews when he makes a point and says, we're not going to get into this, but if you want to unpack it more, here's a resource for you. And I think we need to make that more of a normality of saying, hey, here are more resources, providing them in maybe the, the handout that we give people on Sunday mornings or the bulletin or whatever you call it, maybe put it on the screen at some point during uh, before the service starts. Um, the idea being is saying, hey, here is a, a plethora of other resources that's going to help you understand and unpack this more this week. Here you go. Now, again, people are going to hear, you know, a resource by Owen Strand and they're just going to shut down. But the point is that he does offer that as an understanding of what he's talking about. And he's going to use the rest of this sermon uh, using Acts 13 to unpack the reality of the difference between speaking the gospel and living the gospel and the, the real distinction between that in our culture now and using scripture as a way to demonstrate the importance of actually speaking the gospel, right? So though I was very critical of the first two minutes of this sermon, what Ken's really done now is, is really given us a very wide topic that he's going to get into and unpack both sides of and the importance of using scripture, why one is actually been very neglected, but is very important to do. That's right. Let's, let's, let's now enter into that. But I wanted to show you kind of what he did here. And one of the things that I was incredibly impressed with when I heard this sermon uh, the first time through, which is something I harp on all the time, give some extra resources. And he does do that. So I thought that was very helpful. I recently read some interesting results from a poll that Barna Research Group conducted regarding today's American evangelical attitude towards evangelism. And for example, I want you to listen to the following statement as I have the guys throw it up on the screen. Listen to what they said in their, their poll. It is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. How many practicing Christians do you suppose agree with that statement? And by practicing Christians, according to Barna's poll, we're speaking of people who identify as Christians, who say that their Christian faith is very important to them, and they attend church. I know that doesn't tell us the whole story, but how many people who practice their Christian faith would you say agreed with that statement behind me, that it is wrong, it is morally wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that one day they will share the same faith. And of course, what is that statement talking about? That's evangelism, isn't it? That's proclaiming Jesus. The necessity of broadly and proclaiming this unique message that has been entrusted to us as God's people. It may seem obvious to all of us here this morning in this room, but not so to nearly half of millennial practicing Christians polled in Barna's research. 47% of those polled actually agree that it is wrong to share your faith that way. Let that sink in. What's fascinating about their research is that the same data indicates that while nearly half of practicing Christians believe evangelizing is wrong, 96% of the very same group polled say that part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. So help me figure that one out. All right, so one thing that is also often neglected in setting the bar. So again, one of the things that I would say is like, yeah, we haven't got into scripture yet, which is one of the things that I always critique about, like how long does it take us to get into scripture? But one of the things that he is doing that I'll give him a credit for is that he says he's setting this up to say, okay, well, here's what we hear a lot of the time as far as living out ministry instead of speaking it. Also, here are some statistics to demonstrate that uh, young evangelicals don't think that they should even be doing this. Like, actual data that's demonstrating that there are Christians that don't think they should be evangelizing. So what does scripture say about not evangelizing and using the statistics here in a way that sort of interests and show us the issue that we may not think is an issue. So as when we get to scripture and start unpacking it, we understand like, oh, okay, this is a thing then. This isn't and this is where I think this is important. We'll get into, he, he mentioned some terminology later in the sermon that I think is important to sort of unpack some more and define. But here, I think one of the things that he's doing well that we need to do pretty well as pastors or if we're listening to pastors is not just state a problem, but demonstrate that that's an actual problem. Because lots of times people put up like straw men uh, and try to explain them away. 
and when they're not actually a problem or a full fledge of a problem as maybe they make it out to be. Here, he's demonstrating that the statement he just made before this, which is, hey, there's lots of people that don't speak the gospel but think that living it's okay. He then backs up that statement with this data from Barna so that when he gets to Scripture, like we understand that it's a, it's at least, uh, uh, you know, tr data trackable information, datable trackable, I don't, anyway, you get what I'm saying. It's statistically provable that a lot of people don't think they should be doing this. That being said, let's get back into it. How does that even work? How does a Christian, on the one hand, say it's wrong to share my faith with the hopes that somebody else will one day believe as I do, and at the very same time say that being a witness about Jesus is very important, it's a part of my faith? How do those two dissonant ideas co-reside within the same person? And I think the answer lies in the drifting away that has taken place from the proclamational nature of our calling as followers of Jesus, and that is to be very specific, that is verbally sharing the message of the cross of Christ, the use of words toward what is termed lifestyle evangelism. My son Wesley, who, by the way, just got engaged a couple weeks ago. You guys can cheer. All right. We're excited for uh, Emily to become a part of Heiser Nation, and, uh, you know, Wesley... He works for a company that specializes in the supplying of equipment for the gathering of forensic evidence. You guys have seen crime shows, haven't you? And so you know that there's some amazing and advanced technologies out there uh, do, to aid detectives in finding the forensic evidence that is left behind at the scene of a crime, right? Well, th that equipment helps you find the evidence, but then it's the detective's role to take what is found and to interpret it, to in one sense give voice to what the evidence is trying to say. And I think this is how many pro professing believers today have in some sense redefined what it means to be a witness for Jesus. Rather than proclaim the truth of the gospel and then risk offending someone who doesn't want to hear it, they just would rather show Jesus to others through their life. And it's true, our lives should show patterns of transformation. Isn't that right? We should be walking in the Spirit. We should be bearing the fruit of the Spirit that comes from surrender to Jesus Christ. That much certainly is not in dispute here. And I also agree that the world doesn't want our preaching. People don't want to hear a gospel that will expose their sins and require of them a humble repentance. But I would add that this is exactly what the world needs. This world needs preachers. You see, we cannot shift the impetus of our witness onto the lost person, can we? As if it's their job to be a detective, to search through your life and find the evidence and then give voice to that evidence in, in such a way that will lead them to a knowledge of Christ. It doesn't work that way. There's no such thing as a silent witness. This whole adage that is so popular today, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words... That doesn't work. That sounds nice until it is that you realize that there really has been a shift away from the use of words. A large portion of today's evangelicals have abandoned the use of the words of the gospel entirely. All right, so one of the things that he's um, taking a while to, to build up to, I'm, I'm very mixed about this because he, he, he's taken a very long time to build up to the scripture here. So he, he's defined his point, right? The idea that... Um, that lots of people will think that uh, living the gospel rather than speaking the gospel is the way to actually evangelize. He's backed that up with words uh, as far as data and whatnot from Barna. And he is presenting here one of the things that does, there is a distinctive sort of line in Christianity today about right so if you talk to i mean I, I would say if you pull like just ask a random question this random question to six of your friends you're probably going to see a pretty even split um or hopefully you see an even split uh, among your friends if not you have like <laughs> you you need more diverse christian friends but um the, just the question of like do you when's the last time you talked to somebody about jesus right and probably what you're going to find with at least half your friends is that half of them are going to go i oh, it's been it's been years, months since I've actually talked to somebody about Jesus. And that's his point here. His point is that many of us, many of those that are in the church, many of the, those that claim to be Christians, haven't actually evangelized to anybody. 
right? In the in the sense of saying, hey, you're a sinner in need of Jesus. Like they just haven't had that conversation. Most of the time, what you'll find is that the prevalent idea is what he said here, which is that, you know, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. I remember in college, that was something that was really being propagated, even amongst my professors uh, that were teaching us to be pastors, is this idea that your life should bear witness to Christ, and then your life bearing witness to Christ will give you an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Um, I have at some points, thinking back on my preaching, lean that way a lot harder than I should have, uh, because what he's saying is accurate. Oftentimes, you can live a godly life for a very long time before anybody even asks you, like, why? Right Now, there are times, and I have plenty of examples in my personal life, where living a godly life then does give you a doorway into speaking the gospel. Ken's point here, though, seems to state from scripture, which he's, he, this is the point where I'm like, let's, let's get to scripture. Um, but his point is going to be that speaking the gospel is the primary way that, that we, we evangelize, not living our lives in, in a Christian way, because Christian living your life in a Christian way can be very conflated with moralism, which people aren't really, who cares if you live that way? Like, so his point is, Speaking the gospel is the important part. And what you will find if you talk to enough Christians is that some people are going to get very passionate about this, saying that they don't need to talk about Jesus. Living their life will give them a doorway in order to then earn the respect of others that then give them the opportunity to speak. And Ken's point here does not seem to be earning the respect of anyone. His point seems to be, and I think you're going to see that it, you know, it's when we do get to Acts 13, that um, the idea here is, is that you should speak Jesus. <laughs> that you, you should be evangelizing verbally um, while also living a Christian life. But the speaking of the gospel comes first. So let's let's let him get into it. Like I said, I'm a little torn because we, we've been, it's been about 10 minutes and we're not into scripture yet. But realistically, I know we've been, this, this video has been 30 minutes, but he's only been preaching for 10. So it seems maybe like it's taking, it's, it's taking longer than I would like to get to scripture. But really, Within sermon building time, he, he, he has a decently sized intro. I'm just impatient. Let's keep going. Austin Gentry in his blog says this, saying that you can preach the gospel but only sometimes use words is to falsely imply that the gospel is not really words at all. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing a rejection of the true nature of our calling as disciples to boldly proclaim Christ in exchange for a less confrontational version that calls for us being a witness through being nice. And that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. And I think that's a threat we can't ignore today. And I'm burdened that the church in some sense has lost sight of what her mission actually is and has replaced it, at least to some degree, with one that relies more on a temporary transformation that we hope to bring to society through our human efforts, through things like social justice movements and other such things, and less and less on the unique, divine, eternal transformation that can only come as the Holy Spirit of God applies the Word of God to the blinded eyes of the unbeliever so that they might see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ and so be saved. So what I would like to do with you this morning as we go into our text, Acts chapter 13, verse 47, is to show that Paul clearly understood the nature of his calling to be proclamational, and so should we. This is the, the origin story of how the gospel came to us, how it reached us, and proclaiming Christ will be the only way that we can fulfill our calling, our mission, as his people. And before we begin, we need to go to God for help. So why don't we do that? Let's pray. Father, I'm aware that there is a real battle here this morning. There's an enemy that doesn't want Christ to be seen. He doesn't want him to be proclaimed. And as we talk about the nature of what you're calling each of us here to do this morning, we often face the fear of man, Lord. We face fears of rejection and of inadequacy. And I feel that too. 
as well this morning. So Lord, would you encourage us today, encourage us with your promise as we reflect on how you graciously brought the good news of Jesus into our lives through the obedience of believers who have preceded us. And God, then would you help us, would you strengthen us, would you allow us to join their company and to be proud of Jesus, to speak of him to others, all for your glory and for the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray these things, amen. Here in today in America, June is known as Pride Month, isn't it? It's a month in which a culture so filled with sinful pride not only practices open rebellion against God, shaking their fists in the public square in defiance of our God, but also gives hearty approval to those who do such things. It's a country now that has taken God's own symbol of covenant promise and has so twisted it into a symbol of open rebellion against the character of our God. And it's sad, isn't it? But what's even sadder is how few Christians are truly proud of Jesus. And church, we need to take back June. We need to take back July. And we need to take back every month on the calendar. And we need to declare those months to be proud months where we as followers of Jesus Christ are proud of our Jesus and we will join the Apostle Paul as he said in Romans chapter 1 that we are not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the, God, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Isn't that right? The cross of Jesus Christ is the true symbol of inclusion because at the foot of the cross, anyone who repents and believes in the Savior can be gloriously forgiven and saved from eternal judgment. So if we want to see lost people saved, we will need to answer God's call to be proud of Jesus in a world of pride. Open your Bibles, Acts 13. So just real quick, that one of the things that we're looking for, right? One of the things that if you listen to enough sermons or if you're, if you're just trying to follow along with the train of thought that he's already set up that last part, though, I would agree. I think I would word it a little bit differently, but that last section between the prayer and then opening the scripture seems to be really wedged in, right? It seems to be like, Oh, this is June. This is pride month. We need to say something about it. And it seems wedged in. Because we could have went, we've built up this sermon all the way up to this point about saying that we need to proclaim the gospel with our mouths and not just assume that living it out is going to state it. Then his statement is, we're going to look at scripture and see that Paul actually uh, is saying the same is saying the same thing. That is the proclamation of the gospel, not simply living the gospel out that the Christian should actually be doing. Then he prays, then he he could have just opened scripture to Acts chapter 13 and got into it, but it seems like he wedges this, this pride thing into this just because it's June. Now, here's the thing. Again, though I would agree with him that, uh, that, that culture is just overwhelmingly proud of their sin, um, in particular in the month of June, and Christians overwhelmingly typically are not very vocal or proud of the things that we believe in as far as vocally um, in culture. Um this seems like it's it's wedged into a sermon that it doesn't necessarily need to be wedged in, at least at this point, at, right? We could have went right into the scripture. Now, again, it's here nor there. You could take it or leave it. This is clearly uh, just like my, my input to this. But if we're looking at sermon building and the flow really well, there's a few things we could have cut out right? We could have cut out the, the dad joke at the beginning, the Superman reference, and then just introed into like what we talked about. I think that he did a really good job up to this point of covering um, as far as, hey, this is what society or what Christians typically think they should do as far as evangelism. Here's some data to back that up. Here's some people and resources that you can look at that demonstrate that this, not, this backs up the data that we've already looked about. Now let's go into Acts chapter 13 and see what Paul is saying in regards to actually speaking the truth instead of just living it out that demonstrates that, you know, the data, like how people think currently is incorrect and let's use scripture to show the correct way of thinking, right? That's how the sermon building really uh, has been, but there's been like these clunky parts kind of put in, like I said, the Superman reference, the pride thing, um, that could, that if taken out, don't deter from the sermon and actually make it 
the, uh, flow a little bit better. Now, let, let's listen into what he says, because I think what he just said could is useful, but maybe could be put in a different part of the sermon. So let's go to Acts chapter 13, verse, uh, what did he say? Acts chapter 13, verse 47. Again, anytime a pastor mentions a Bible reference, you want to go there, you want to read along with him. So let's get into it. 13, 47. And actually, for a bit of context, we're going to read beginning in verses 44 through 48. Okay, there you go. Let's hear the word of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Our goal together this morning is to be reminded of something we already know and then to reflect on that truth with a humble readiness to respond. And I believe that our text this morning is driving me, is driving you, is driving every one of us individually, all of us collectively as a local body of Christ to remember our origin story. If we want to see more lost people saved, well, let me ask you, do you want to see more lost people saved? I didn't hear that very well. Do you want to see more lost people saved? Yes. Amen. May it be so. Well, then, church, we need to stick to what we know. You see, it's not preach the gospel at all times and, if necessary, use words. No. It is preach the gospel at all times and let your transformed life demonstrate the reality of the words you proclaim. So here's the big idea for us this morning. Actually, it's not even an idea it's our calling. It's our calling. You and I are called to proclaim the good news. And I want to encourage you this morning by showing you five ways that you and I are called to preach Christ. Number one, you can preach Christ confidently. You can preach Christ confidently. The context here now is that Paul is preaching the gospel to a group of Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles, we know, is simply a non-Jew, the nations, the peoples. And this text is part of all right, so before he gets too far into it, what he's going to do, is, as he's already stated, is give us five points from the text he read as application. So what you're going to notice here, and what I want you to look for, is that this isn't um, what you would consider maybe typical verse-by-verse -verse preaching, because he's not necessarily going to go back through and preach the verses that he talked about as much as he is going to pull five principles out of the text that he's reading to demonstrate that these are applicable to the believer now um, to use based on what based on what Paul has is doing here in Acts. So there is a bit of a distinction um, between typically what you would see as a verse by verse preaching versus a uh, read a section of scripture and then pull principles out. This isn't necessarily what you would do. like. This isn't topical preaching in as much as it is pulling. Uh, point out. So this is a bit different. It's a little bit different of a sermon than typically we've looked at. Most of the sermon reviews we've done up to this point are heavily topical sermons, which somebody picks a topic and then they go searching through scripture to find scripture to support that topic. Or it's expositional, which is literally like they'd read a huge section of scripture and then work verse by verse through it. This is a little bit different. It's more of a middle ground in regards to reading it and then pulling principles out. So it's not highly topical, but there is a more of a direct line of application, if that makes sense, uh, to the point rather than doing verse by verse and then giving application. It's, it's sort of a combination of topical and, and expositional, if that hopefully that makes sense to you. So his first one is you can preach Christ confidently and let's see how he connects his point then that he's pulled out of scripture to the scripture itself. Part of a second discourse that Paul and Barnabas are giving at Antioch of Pisidia on their, their first missionary journey. 
Verses 16 through 42 detail their visit to the synagogue where Paul, at his first opportunity, stood up, he motioned with his hands, and he began to preach Jesus as the promised Savior. And there he is confidently preaching Christ. Many, Luke tells us in verse 43, of the Jews and the devout converts to Judaism believed the message Paul preached, and so they responded in faith. The very next week, we are told that nearly the whole city, can you imagine it? The whole city comes to hear the word of the Lord. It created a big, big stir their preaching, didn't it? But the faction of Jews that weren't pleased, they became very jealous. They didn't like all of this attention, this new preaching was drawing as they posed Paul, and they began to revile him. The NIV translates that word, they were talking abusively to them. Isn't it one of the fears that we face when we think about sharing Jesus with someone? It's the reaction that we're going to get. We're always concerned for the kind of rejection and response. So again, I can guarantee at some time, at some point, when you begin to share Jesus, you will get that reaction. And trust me, it's not pleasant. A couple of weeks ago, I recently attended a sporting KC game with a couple guys in our church. Uh, we were there with our Romanian partner, Gabby, and sitting there in the section of the sta stadium, I was shocked at all the uninhibited vitriol and abusive speech that were being hurled from these fans toward these players on the opposing team. I was convinced that they did not know these players personally, but that did not stop them from speaking to them with such abuse. Why did they do that? It's because they wore a different jersey. Friends, this is the kind of thing that we can expect. When you realize that the anger, the, the jealousy, the vitriol, it's not aimed at you. It's because you wear the Savior's jersey. This is a reminder to all of us because no matter how nice and gentle we might try to be, we cannot underestimate the resistance of the proud human heart once the truth of, and the light of God's word begins to expose sin. Paul and Barnabas demonstrate confidence because they wear the Savior's jersey. Luke writes in verse 46 in our text that Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. They shake off the rejection from this group of jealous Jews, and they turn to the Gentiles, and they say to them in verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light for the Gentiles. This is our origin story. And what does it begin with? Preaching. Before we get deeper into verse 47, I think it's going to be helpful to uh, skip backward in time in one sense by turning forward in our Bibles all the way to Acts chapter 26. So if you would do that with me, Acts chapter 26. One of the things, too, that you're going to look for, um, and we've, we've talked about this before uh, in these sermon reviews, that there are going to be times that there's going to be text in which um, they're, they're cross-referencing uh, or connecting to. And one of the things you always want to do if, if, if Scripture is mentioned you want to turn there. Now, the one thing that's really good is that Ken here does encourage us to go with him. And so we are going to go with him. But even if he didn't, if he just mentioned Acts 26, you at least want to go there. Uh, it's going to be more difficult to follow along if the pastor's not asking you to follow them and giving you reference to where they're going. But you at least want to make note of that or go there so that you can see if they're being true to scripture. Ken here asks us to come along for that very reason so that he can demonstrate um uh, one of the points he's going to try to make. So let's keep going. Acts 26 is one of my favorite passages in all of the New Testament for how it demonstrates the, the clarity of Paul's call to ministry as well as his resolve to fulfill that calling. And in Acts 26, Paul has been given the opportunity in his imprisonment to give a defense, to give his testimony before King Agrippa. And we want to listen in on this conversation as he tells of his encounter many years prior with the risen Lord Jesus Christ on that pivotal day in his life when he was torn away from his old life as a persecutor of Christians and set on a brand new path with a new mission of preaching Christ. And what I want you to see here in Acts 26 is that you and I can preach Christ confidently for three reasons. Look at verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. <clears throat> Let's just point out that what Saul, as he used to be called, did here, he did because he was authorized, right? He was commissioned. He was commissioned to put an end to these pesky Christians who were propagating and peddling false and blasphemous lies. This was his belief. And so Saul... and Real quick, I know this is a totally a side note to the sermon we're doing here. Also, if you're not, if you're listening to this and not watching this, you haven't even noticed it. 
but this camera has like went out of focus and back into focus like a dozen times. <laughs> I know this has nothing to do with the sermon review at all, but one of the things I think as we enter the age in which obviously we're recording our sermons all the time, both video and audio, um, is if you're going to do it, there's some churches that don't, I, I totally understand that, right? But if you're going to do it, try to get somebody that, that can be, can inform your church on audio and uh, video equipment so that like the, the, this experience isn't impaired. Right. So for example, he's, he's, there's been times in this video where he's been super washed out. Um, and that seems like not this big deal and it's really not a big deal, but it is a bit distracting. Like just a little, just a little annoyance of the video camera being unfocused and focused again. I know these are very minor things in comparison to the entire sermon, but it will help people uh, more easily view your video and listen to the audio if it's if it's good audio and it's good video. Um, there's just a level of of care and excellence when you put into things that nobody will ever compliment you on because it's done right all the time, but they will notice if it's if it's like done incorrectly, like the, the focus in and out. So I total side note, just wanted to mention it because it's literally almost the 12th time I think that's happened. Um, but anyway, nothing to do with sermon review. Let's get back to it. In one sense was a missionary sent out to chase down these early Christians, but everything's about to change. Look at verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. So it's high noon. I have a hard time imagining something brighter than the sun at high noon. But here we are. The radiance of the glory of the risen Lord Jesus Christ is shining so brightly it knocks Paul and his companions flat to the ground. Look at verse 14. And when we had fallen all to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. That's a change of events, isn't it? Saul had been convinced that the claims of these Christ followers about a resurrection, all of that was a lie. And these Christians, they deserve to be punished. He was zealous and sincere for what he believed. He was authorized and commissioned to pursue what he believed. And he often did so with a raging fury, didn't he? But in an instant... The light of the world, brighter than the sun, overwhelms him, utterly bringing to nothing all of his resistance to what these very same people he had been persecuting were proclaiming and preaching. And I love that. Because what that tells me is that it is nothing for Jesus Christ to change the whole course of a person's life in a moment. Do you believe that? Do you believe God can do that? Our puny human rebellion dissolves into utter nothingness in the face of the glory of Jesus Christ. Look at what happens, verse 16. <clears throat> but rise, Jesus says to Paul, and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Okay, so now Saul, who had been sent, who had been authorized, commissioned by the chief priest to eradicate these Christians and their message, was now finding himself under a brand new authority, under the same risen Christ he once denied. He's got a new authority, he's got a new mission, and now he's being sent. And pay attention now to the nature of his calling. What is Jesus sending him to do? Look at verse 18. He's sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is telling Paul to preach a message of repentance and faith. How do we know? Well, we don't really even have to guess because Paul will explain it for us as he continues his defense before Agrippa. Look what he says in verse 19. Therefore, Agrippa... I was not disobedient. I love this. Paul is saying, that day when the risen Lord Jesus appeared to me so many years ago, it changed everything. Meaning I had a new authority over my life, an authority that ruled over all other authorities. I had to obey this Jesus, and I did. There was no other option. 
Paul preached Christ confidently. Why? Because his preaching, number one, was commanded by Christ. It was commanded by Christ. This is our hope. This is our confidence and our calling, friends, that God can take a hater and turn him into a worshiper just like that. It's what God does. He takes the spiritually dead, and as Paul later writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he makes them new creations, right? It's a divine work of grace that calls into being something brand new, a new creation, something that did not previously exist. The old things, the old self under an old authority and an old master, those things have all passed away, and in a moment in time, it's all becoming new. Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Verse 20, but what did he do? Look at verse 20. What did he do? He declared. He says, I declared, I preached, I proclaimed first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, I declared, I preached, what? That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And it's verse 21, it's for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Listen, King Agrippa, King Agrippa, I want you to know something I was taken into captivity, and I stand before you this very day, not because I did something wrong, but because Jesus Christ made me a preacher. And he preached Christ confidently because his preaching was commanded by Christ. Secondly, Paul demonstrates that we can preach Christ confidently because we are cared for by God. Look at verse 22. Paul says, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. I can continue preaching confidently. Why? Because Christ commanded me, number one, and number two, because God helps me. I am cared for by God. And so he says in verse 22, I stand here testifying both to small and to great. And isn't this awesome? How many times have you had an opportunity to engage somebody in a gospel conversation and have succumbed to fear? Anybody with me on that one? You've been there? All right, so let's stop, because that was a long section in which he, he was talking there. And one of the things... I think that he, he, oh, sorry, I'm hitting, hitting poles over here. So one of the things that he, um, I think he does really well here, and I think probably this should have just been his main text, <laughs> to be honest with you. I see why he started in Acts 13, but um, coming here to Acts 26 makes a lot more sense in regarding to making his points. Um, but working through it, one of the things that, uh, the first thing we always look for is, is, is the text read? And there is a ton of text read. And this is incredibly important. I want, I want to show you why this is important. And I hope you, I don't even have to show you, I hope you've seen it. But everything he's saying is coming from the text. I've said this a thousand times. If you've watched any of these sermon reviews, you probably are just, ex like, you just know it's coming. That what I'm going to say, when people leave the service at a sin church, they're not going to say, Ken had some really good points. What they probably are going to be saying is, wow, did not Ken preach the word of God today? Like he opened it up. We, we've looked at Acts chapter 13. We've looked at Acts chapter 26. And everything Ken has said has come from the word of God, right? That's why out of the three things we look for in every sermon, the number one thing is, did they read scripture? Because that's, that's the foundation of, uh, of us coming together and fellowshipping and opening the Word of God and learning from it, right? Being edified by it, being uh, told, hey, this is, as believers, what you should be doing. This is what a believer looks like. This is our call. This is like all of these things come from coming together. And we're not going to know that if somebody just gets up and talks, you know, some motivational, inspirational thing and doesn't touch the Scripture. Ken opens the scripture here rightly and then walks us through it, demonstrating points that are now directly applicable to the believer's life. The first one being that you can do it confidently. The second one being is you can do it confidently because God is with you. And he's bringing this from the scripture, demonstrating uh, the truth and reality of this from the scripture. And that's why the numbers, the second thing we're looking for is like, is, is there... Is there exegetical work done here for, for application? Like, can you say, this is what you should do as believers because this is what we see here in the scripture. And this is a one, I mean, he, he's done exactly this. So again, for all of my nitpicking, right, on, on what could or could not be put here, this part of the sermon is incredibly solid. 
that's why when I said at the beginning, when somebody put this on online and said, hey, this is a great sermon, I wanted to watch it because typically we don't have like a lot of the sermons that are sent in are typically not like great sermons. Um, and that's the reason they're sent in. People want people want those reviewed because typically when they send them in, the email email or DM I get says, hey, I'm a little bit concerned about X, Y, Z. Right. So what I want to present to you this morning is like a good sermon. Now, this he he's he's. He's got three more points. We're going to see how far we can get into it because I don't want to take a ton of your time up, but um, let's see how much farther we can get into this sermon before we need to cut it off because he's still got a, a pretty good amount of time left um, in, in his particular sermon as well. And I've talked a bunch, so this has made the, the, the review a bit longer, but I did want to demonstrate those two points is that he's done a great job of directing us towards scripture pulling out what scripture says and then making a direct application to the believer as well. And that's it. Well, here, let, let's let him continue. And then I'll make another point here in a minute. I know I have. And in those moments, where is my focus? It's right here, isn't it? It's on me. It's on my abilities. It's on my reputation. It's on my comfort. Comfort. It's not on God. It's not on his faithfulness. It's not on his character. And it's certainly not on the fact that he wants to help me. And friends, I think we can move past our hesitancies and fears in our witness for Jesus Christ when we realize that God is our help. There are three things that are true about every opportunity you and I have to be a witness. Number one, everyone you meet, and I mean everyone, is on a spiritual journey. We are all created in the image of God. We are all designed to find our ultimate satisfaction in the worship of our creator. Number two, God is already at work. God is at work in that person's life long before you ever came on the scene, just like he was in yours. And number three, God wants to use you. He wants to use you. And since he wants to use you, he will help you. He will be your help. Look at verse 22. I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. Paul is confident because his pre in his preaching because he was commanded by Christ. Be number two, because he was cared for by God. And number three, his message was confirmed by the scriptures. Look at what he says. I was saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. You understand, don't you, that when I or someone else steps behind this pulpit to preach, when you speak to your neighbor, when you share with your family or your coworker or your friend, that we have no confidence and no authority in and of ourselves. Isn't that right? The only confidence that we have is, that, is such that when our message aligns and agrees with what God has already said. So what Ken does here is point back to the very point I was making before. Like, not only for pastors, when we're unpacking the word, that you don't want to say, oh, Ken has some really good points. You want to say, wow, Scripture was powerful today. Like, the, the truth of Scripture hit me, right? And he basically says the same thing for us as believers. That as we're, as we're evangelizing, we, we need to continually go back to Scripture because it's not our authority in which we're, we're coming from. It's the authority of Scripture. So not only is Ken demonstrating this in his sermon the, by, 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 doing, by actually doing that himself, pointing back to Scripture, but he's encouraging his people or the people he's talking to, to to do the same thing. So he's not only modeling it, he's saying this is the way it should be. It's not your authority. It's Scripture's authority. Now, the point I was going to make before that I, I hope this is a little bit more subtle, but I hope you've seen it especially if you've watched a lot of the sermon reviews, is that there are two ways that pastors approach sermons on sort of a, a, a base level, which is an understanding that the majority of people they're talking to are either believers or the majority of people they're talking to are unbelievers. In more secret sensitive churches, the assumption is that a good number of people in the audience don't know Jesus. So typically, those services are very evangelistic, if you want to call that that in nature, in regards to really preaching a more of a, a come to Jesus sort of message that always ends in an altar call. Ken here, his assumption is clearly that almost everyone, if not everyone, 
in, in, in that he's talking to already knows the gospel, has already made a commitment to follow Jesus. Therefore, what he's calling them to isn't salvation. They already have salvation. He's calling them to an evangelism in their life by vocally preaching Christ. So that does make a huge difference. In a lot of secret sensitive churches, you'll have a very much more every Sunday is an evangelistic message about come to Jesus because the assumption is the majority of people in the church aren't Christians. So it's really hard to go deeper on a Sunday because you're already starting with the assumption of a lot of people in here don't know Jesus. Whereas Ken is able to go quite a bit deeper when he's talking about what we should do is because his assumption is already that people know Jesus here. All right, so let's keep going. His point, he's on point three. He's only got two more left. We don't need to figure out how to convince people. God does that work. You will drive yourself nuts trying to anticipate every possible response that a person might give you. You'll be paralyzed. Do you know what will make you really confident in your witness? Do you know what that will be? Is know the gospel well. Know the message. Preach the gospel to yourself. Know it well. And what was his message? Look at verse 23. He's saying, I preach that the Christ may suffer, must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Listen, I believe that Paul's conversion demonstrates clearly that the nature of our calling is proclamational. Paul was not arrested. Listen, he was not arrested because he built, dig a, dug a well or because he grew a crop or because he was a nice neighbor. And all of those are good things. I'm not even remotely suggesting that we shouldn't be concerned for people in need and for the well-being of our society. Compassion ministry absolutely has its place in the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it should never and it must never substitute the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the nature of our call. It's proclamational. And you and I can preach Christ confidently because the Lord is in charge. And he, the Lord, as Paul says, as we turn back to Acts 13, verse 47, the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light. Number two, you can preach Christ confidently, or, and then you can preach Christ authentically. Number two, authentically. You probably see in your English... So one of the things here, and this is, I forgot that I got confused on this the first time as well, is that let, let's, let's make the assumption that the people that are sitting in a sin church have some sort of handout or bullets in front of them that breaks down this sermon. So that, that, that Ken has already had the forethought to put, to give to the people that make the handout like his outline, right? So all the points he has are already down and maybe there's like fill in the blank sort of stuff to keep people like following along. Let's assume that's happened. If that has happened, awesome job. You know, it's going to be a whole lot easier not to get lost on point one, point two, sub point one, sub point two, sub, 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 sub point one, sub point two. Like he's had a lot of points here. Like there's been a lot of times where he's numbered things one through three or one through four, or one through five. So he's actually only on point two of his main points, even though under point one, we've had a sub point. I think we've had like three sub points and under one of those sub points, we've had like even more unpacking. The point is, as we're watching this, it's incredibly hard to follow along by what his main points are and distinguish them from what his sub points are. Now, if you're sitting in service and you have some sort of handout in front of you where that is outlined, not a big deal at all because you can follow along really easily and not get lost. Whereas we're watching this, we don't have that handout. It's really easy to get lost on like where we're at. Like what point are you making? Because uh, as I've, I, I mean, like I said, I've already watched this once, but as we were just now, like I just now said, he was on point three. He's only got two points left. I was wrong because that was a sub point. So now we're only on point two of his five main points. Anyway, that was probably just as confusing to explain as it, as it is to follow the points. As a pastor, try to make sure that this is incredible. Like this is, this isn't difficult to follow along, especially if you're trying to say, these are the five things you have to know from this scripture. Um, now, again, as I said, if the people of a sin church have a handout in front of them and that's all explained, 
you you've accomplished your task because us watching it not as imperative that we have it because we can watch it back but as far as sermon flow goes and ease of communication let like as pastors we need to try to make this as easy as possible for people to follow and not get confused about where we're at or just eliminate the points altogether just just say your piece and don't one two three you know don't don't break it down but anyway let's keep going English Bibles that Acts 13 47 is set apart in quotes don't you that indicates that Paul is quoting another scripture in fact he is he's quoting Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 since time is brief this morning I'm going to tell you what I think is going on here Paul I believe appeals to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah as both the authority for Jesus own ministry of preaching as well as for the authorization of the preaching that we as Christ followers would be sent to do in his name. So Isaiah 49 verse 6 is addressing the suffering servant. I think we understand this, that Jesus is the object of that passage. Simeon actually affirms that in Luke chapter 2 verse 32, where he says, and he applies Isaiah's words to Jesus, Simeon says, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, listen, a light for revelation to who? To the Gentiles. We already saw that Paul affirms it before Agrippa when he told us that Jesus told him he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. John affirms it in his gospel in chapter 1 when he writes, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And our Lord Jesus speaks of himself this way in John chapter 8 when he says, I am the light of the world. So, The Father made the Son, according to Isaiah, a light for the nations. And this much I think we understand clearly. We preach because Jesus is authentically the true light. Israel was supposed to be the light to the Gentile nations, but they failed to fulfill their role. So God sent Jesus, the true light, And Paul, in our text, in Acts 13, 47, look at what he says. He doesn't just say that Jesus is the light. He actually says the Lord commanded who? Us. The Lord commanded us to be a light to the nations. Is he misapplying Isaiah? I don't think so. Not at all. Paul understood clearly that Jesus is the true light to the nations, but he also understood that Jesus had commanded, had commissioned his people to be a light to the nations, those who bear his name, those who proclaim his gospel, those of us who are ambassadors of his kingdom. Listen, that's you and me. This is why Paul can say the Lord commanded us. And when you are saved by Christ, you become a light. You don't need to do anything except to share what that true light has done for you. You preach Christ authentically. Number three, you can preach Christ indiscriminately. He says, I... Real quick, one of the things there, and I, I, again, I've only watched this sermon once, um... So I haven't, you know, done any deep dive into any of the scripture here. But just for context sake, starting at verse 46, and it says, And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, again, they're speaking to, um, well, let's just go back to verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul uh, by reviling him. And Paul said, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and ju- and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light uh, for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. Um, again, I haven't I haven't looked at this you know intently, but it seems what Paul is saying is he's quoting again like. Like Ken said, he's quoting Isaiah to them um, in regards to the light. And I think that the application um, that he's he's making here um, with Jesus um, isn't, isn't necessarily a bad disconnect uh, or, or a bad interpretation. But it seems like Paul, what's Paul saying to the jealous Jews is that you you were the light, but you, th- you, you thrust aside, you didn't do it. Which, again, Ken mentions that the Jews were the ones that were supposed to example that out to the world and they didn't do it very, they didn't, they didn't do it well. Um, I don't know. I just feel like this, this may be, there's maybe some deeper 
exegetical work that could be done here in relation to what Paul is saying to the Jews, uh, specifically quoting Isaiah. Um, but all that being said, I would have to look into that more. And this is why you should take notes. <laughs> and this is why uh, that way you can look back at it later. I don't what I guess. Let me say this before we move on. I don't think that Ken is mis misrepresenting the text. I just think that there's a bit more that could be dug out there. And I think Ken knows that too. I mean, he, he said that. He said that there's more that could be done here. But for the brief amount of time, let me say this. So um, he, he recognized that. Uh, it gives us a brief point and moves on, which again, I think goes back to what I'm saying here, like take note of it, look more into it. Um, that's why the, like the flag came up in my brain to say, Hmm, let's maybe we should look more into that. Um, but he does acknowledge that. And just for, just so we can move on to the sermon review, I don't think he's misappropriating the text. I just think there's a lot more there that could be dug out of it. And Ken clearly does too. He just doesn't uh, feel he has time to do that. Let's keep going. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, for the Gentiles. Now we need to climb just for a moment into the mind of the first century Jew just to grasp the weight of this because on one hand the passage in Isaiah that Paul quotes has direct application to our Lord Jesus and direct application to us who bear his name but it also has in one sense an application to the Jewish nation they were called to share and bring the light of God to the peoples the Gentiles were called by God in one sense to be God's megaphone to the world as far back as Genesis chapter 12, we see God intended to bless the world through his people. Ab when he spoke to Abram in chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It was clearly God's design. We see it in Psalm 96, where he says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all peoples. And then in Psalm 67, verses 1 through 3, which is regarded often as the great commission of the Old Testament, he says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be made known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. But here in Antioch of Pisidia, these Jews, instead of rejoicing that the Gentiles had received the word of the Lord and were worshiping him, they were filled with jealousy. They weren't concerned about God's glory, but rather about their own perceived superiority. This was prejudice. Somehow they felt deserving of God's special attention because of their ethnicity, but not only because of that, but because they had legalistically adhered to their own system of customs and traditions. And when they saw that this message that Paul was proclaiming led the Gentiles to find forgiveness apart from the law, apart from that system, that angered them. Just like Jonah was angry when God showed grace and kindness to the Ninevites. So Paul, in saying now that he was turning to the Gentiles, that this grace of God is now available to all believe that God shows no partiality, he was making quite the statement. You remember Paul? He was a persecutor. He was a Jew. He would have been right with this group of Jews leading the charge of opposition if it weren't for the grace of God that showed him that we're all the same at the foot of the cross. The cross of Christ is inclusive. It invites all men everywhere to repent, and Paul understood that. Let me ask you, how indiscriminate are we? So earlier in the uh, sermon review, I mentioned that after the prayer before he read, it felt like the whole Pride Month comment was wedged in in a way that wasn't really helpful to the whole building of the sermon. I think that, as I said before, you could have taken that out and then included it here, right? If you really like, if you felt like that was a very nece like a necessary thing to add, that right there would have been a really good place to put it, right? So he's talking about. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the gospel goes out indiscriminately to people. There isn't, um, you know, a perceived uh, superiority. Uh, there shouldn't be a perceived per uh, superiority rather in the gospel message. And that would have been a really good place to put the whole pride comment that he mentioned earlier, right? He could have stuck it in there, um, and made that connection just as he did before, as far as the cross is inclusive, because anyone that comes in repentance to Jesus is in, can, can come to Christ. And so that would have been a good spot to fit that. So when we're building the sermon and we're looking at like, what's a good spot? Like, I want to say this because I think it's important based upon the month that I'm preaching this. 
they were just looking at where can this fit well, that would have been a really good spot to, 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 to fit that. So um, let's give him five more minutes. We're not going to get through this whole sermon. It's really long. Plus I've spoken and interjected quite a bit, um, but I don't want to make this a you know, incredibly long sermon review. So let's give him five more minutes to sort of sum up what he's saying, and then we'll kind of close this out and see what we can take from it. Let me just draw out something that came up in the same Barna research that I mentioned earlier on evangelism. Interesting that in that research, did you know that among practicing Christians that were polled, two in five, two in five of these Christians say they have no non-Christian friends or family members. Just let that sink in too. What does that mean? How, how should that impact us? I'm gonna throw out another number just to get us thinking because I think most of us really like to live in the greenhouse where it's safe and comfortable and controlled. We like to cluster with people that are just like ourselves, but I think we need to step out into the wild a little bit more, don't you think? Do you guys remember Bob Ross? <laughs> the joy of painting on public television? Man. Bob Ross, that's nostalgia for me. He was that, you know, that nature-loving, smooth-talking uh, guy with the big hair. And he was known for making little trees pop, right? Painting the trees in the light color on the bark, dark background and made them pop. You know, I think we need to follow his lead. We need to make the gospel light we've been given pop by taking it into the wild, by getting it into the darkness indiscriminately. Do you realize that 86% of all Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists have never had a Christian friend, ever? Do you know what that means? This is reality, folks. That means billions of Hindus, Muslim people, and Buddhist people will live their entire life here on this planet, and they will never know someone who has been made into a light that could bring them salvation. Someone who could show them the way. And by the way, you and I today, as we reflect on that, have the gospel because somewhere between Acts 13 and today, individual believers chose to break through cultural and linguistic and, yes, geographical barriers, all to pass on a message of life that we needed to hear. The good news of Jesus Christ came to us that way indiscriminately, and praise God it did. That brings us to our fourth aspect of our proclamational calling. Number four, you must preach Christ urgently. Okay, so he is um, going to get to his fourth point. We'll go ahead and stop it here because there's two more. I would encourage you to watch the rest of this sermon. Um, I think that um, he continues what he's done up to this point in regards to following the same sort of um, uh, reading through applying reading through applying so go ahead and watch that link in the description below as i've said before um that being said let's sort of sum this up the three things we're looking for are one does he read the scripture two does he uh, exegete the scriptures in culture and context and then apply and does he preach the gospel of christ the first two we've already talked about he's done that throughout this uh sermon where he's read the scriptures he's then applied them using culture and context and he's actually done the third one, which is mentioned the gospel of Christ a number of times in regards to the reason we're even proclaiming it is to tell people of the good news of Jesus Christ, to, to, to draw them to repentance using our words. Um, so he's done all three of those things. Again, as we've worked through it, I think this has been a really good example of a sermon from a pastoral standpoint. We can look at and say, hey, how can we arrange this in a way that maybe isn't uh, like we, we can arrange it in a way that flows a little bit better. Not that Ken didn't, doesn't have a great flowing sermon. I just think there's a couple aspects that I've already pointed out that can maybe be rearranged to help that um, go a little bit smoother. But secondly, I think what we can learn from this sermon is that like uh, the, the, the points that he's made, right? The, the just making sure if we are going to have as many points as we, he, as he has had that, in person, we give the people that are listening sort of an outline so they can follow along with that, take that home, because there's been a lot of information crammed into this section, and we want to make sure they understand it well, and we want to give that to them in a format that's, that's easy to see. Um, but as far as the three points that I look at each sermon review, he's hit every single one of those, and I would encourage you to, again, check out that link below 
to uh, to watch this rest of the sermon so that you can see him kind of bring that to a close. But I don't want to make this an hour and 45 minute sermon review, which it would be if we finish this out. So that being said, guys, go ahead and click that link below. Also, if you like what we do here and you want to support it more, there's links in the description below to both our resources as well as the Patreon, as well as just, you know, something as simple as liking and subscribing to this channel helps out as well. If there's something you heard that you think I missed or something that you think he did really well that maybe I didn't point out like I should have, make sure you leave that in the comment section below as well. Guys, thank you for watching and I'll talk. See you next week.